Great. So we're now going to move into a panel discussion. And what we have here, um, this panel is focused on uh, basic biology and um, the use of, of modern code for understanding basic biology. It's going to be chaired by Gary Carpin. And there'll be additional speakers who Gary will, will introduce. So welcome. Um, oh, there we go. OK, so uh, first, uh, as, as Lee said, we are uh, having a discussion, which means your involvement. Um, we've sort of, uh, as you'll see, we've come up with some questions, but uh, that's pretty much it for us. Um, we have no more ideas. So <laughs> maybe I should just speak for myself. Uh, please wave as I say your name. So um, yes, I'm Gary Carpin. I'm the moderator. The fact that Elise thought that I could do anything moderately was <laughs> cute. Uh, Dave McAlpine, uh, Brenton Gravely, Valerie Renke, and Susan Mango. OK, so um, just to start out, the way we're going to organize this is we're going to have these four questions. We're going to, um, yes. Um, Sorry, that's a, maybe somewhat of an in-joke. You have to either be from New York or um, Ashkenazi Jewish or something like that. Anyway, uh, we have these four questions. We're going to have roughly 10 minutes total directed towards each question. Uh, so we'll, we'll, each of us will get up and present sort of the context for the question. And, and then we'll go through, um, have a discussion. We'll limit the total time to about 10 minutes. So we're giving you this in advance so that if you you really like question four and have some ideas, wait till then and uh, jump in. So where the four questions are going to be, how can we quantitatively analyze chromatin protein localization dynamics, uh, genome-wide at high resolution in single cells, uh, how do we develop tools and approaches to quantitatively describe protein DNA interactions and occupancy, have we comprehensively characterized the transcriptome, and what are the conceptual and practical barriers to effective use of modern code data by the research community, for those of you that can actually see the bottom. And, and the point is, we're, we're actually, as you can tell from the questions, not really um, here to talk about the beauty of modern code and what we've produced, but looking forward, uh, what's needed to, to advance the field, uh, to advance our understanding of, of chromosome biology and, and the other areas that um, modern code touches. Okay, so um, I'll start out and, and I'll just give a very brief um, introduction to the, the question that I want to ask about dynamics. And, and that is that actually this is, uh, since we have other institutes here, I thought I'd point out this comes from a project funded by NIGMS, uh, the, the General Medicine Institute. And I'll just point out, you know, within cells you have, as we've heard already, a couple of different types of chromatin, uh, heterochromatin here in green, euchromatin in red, and heterochromatin is marked by proteins like heterochromatin protein 1, uh, discovered by Sally Elgin a while ago. And this just shows you that if you do look dynamically, if you do live analysis uh, with, for example, HP1 GFP, you see the, um, uh, the uh, HP1 domain, the nucleus is bigger, and it's basically the cell was moving around. Um, whoops. Uh, <laughs> cell was moving around. After you irradiate, this domain just enlarges dramatically. 1.5-fold uh, volume increase, it starts very quickly as soon as you can start to image within three minutes. After radiation, it lasts about five hours. And you have all these um, dynamic protrusions which have now disappeared even though it was supposed to keep looping. So the thing is, and this is uh, the last little bit of data, is just basically you see these dynamic uh, protrusions and you see this dynamic expansion 1.5 fold over the normal volume. But in fact, when you do a chip experiment, and you look at HP1A and you look at untreated 30 minutes after irradiation, 60 minutes after irradiation, um, you still have HP1 in the heterochromatin. Now, this is good. That means this is, a, is, this is an expansion of this domain, not spreading of the protein into euchromatin. But it also tells you that if I'm just doing a chip experiment, I'm going to say nothing's happened. And in fact, a lot has happened. So this gives rise to this question, that, or basically the point that chip the different C's, high C, 5C, 4C, I don't know what's going to be next, um, really only provide static maps um, of cell populations. 
And this is a real problem looking forward and thinking about how we're going to understand function using the kind of data monocode it produces. And so this raises the question, um, well, I guess you could say, should we or can we quantitatively analyze chromatin protein localization uh, dynamics in a genome-wide basis at high resolution in single cells? And Susan's um, uh, discussion, I think, uh, bears directly on this. Um, um, but we're here talking about if we look at the kind of data that we've generated from modern code, for example, and histone mark distributions, how can you really analyze that dynamically in cells um, at the single cell level? And so um, I guess we'll open it up for a few minutes of discussion. Um, again, I would encourage um, not just our panel members, but um, uh, people in the audience to get up to the microphone, Manolis. Uh, <laughs> And uh, also, if you have other questions, just these are launching pads for, uh, for whatever it is you'd like to discuss. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> I, um, I, I have to question the question, <laughs> since you asked me to. In other words, um, Modern code has done so much with technologies that were developed prior to modern code. And I think what you're asking is a huge break in technology in terms of sort of transitioning from, you know, being on Earth to being in space, basically. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's laudable and it's visionary and it's extremely useful. But what I'd like to ask is, could you get there with existing technologies? In other words, is there anything you can do to um, use chromatin immunoprecipitation and use the C's and, and so on and so forth in order to get to aspects of this question that you can then reconstruct perhaps computationally or by integrating different data sets and so on and so forth? So, so I think I'd like to perhaps turn the question around and say, or, or preface it with, in absence of, you know, sort of br breaking technologies of, of, of sort of, um, non-continuous type of, uh, of technological development, can you envision a path with existing technologies of components of this question that perhaps you could, you could obtain? So I think, uh, on? No, I think Turn on the button. Okay. Um, no, I think the point is that we can't do it with existing technologies. We can get there partly. Steve Hennikoff has done the, the catch it type of analysis for H3.3. You can map that uh, and, and other kinds of variants across the genome. Um, I think what I'm mostly trying to point out is that if we want to understand genome function, which is the goal of the ENCODE uh, project and many of our own individual research, we need to go beyond what we currently have. And, and the problems that I see now with current technologies are we can do a lot with respect to populations of cells, and, and CHIP for histone modifications is, is the best example, I think, um, uh, where we don't really have the resources to be tracking what's happening in real time, not just with cytology, but with any of these other methods, um, and really gain, a, gain an understanding of, of what is the basic biology that's underlying what we're seeing. And so we are probably getting, and we'll, we'll discuss this a little more uh, next in a couple of minutes, we're probably getting misled <laughs> by a lot of the, not a lot, but by the type, the, the, the type of technology that we have available today. Sorry. Sorry, the, the question was, um, what about the PAC biotechnology where, or a lot of the nano uh, sequencing methods that are coming down, which are single molecule methods? Um, this can tell you, yes, what's happening for DNA sequence at any particular time, but it's not clear how one can do, for example, chip for histone modification, where the limitations are, are, are currently technical which is how do you get antibody concentration high enough to actually be able to do a chip, for example. So just having the sequencing capacity doesn't answer that. Yes, sorry. Sure. 
<laughs> yeah, well, there are methods for single cell methylation, for instance, but uh, the thing that bothers me is all the animal cell work of the recycling. At one site, you know, over minutes, you, you will be, add a chromatin modifier, take it off, add a sequence specific site, take it off again. And uh, that on one hand, on the other hand, most of the literature suggests that there are bursts of synthesis such that you see the RNA levels of uh, housekeeping genes are not constant from time to time or cell to cell. So I think what you'd have to do is not only get it in single cells, but to get it in an uh, array of single cells in order to get the picture. But I think yeah, except single cell methods are coming along for analysis. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add other than that. I mean, there are groups working on this, and I think it has more potential for histone modifications and such where you probably have, you know, multiple events over a localized area versus, say, transcription factors, which might be, you know, single MERS or a few MERS, and, uh, and it's clear the efficiency of CHIP is quite low. Um, I do think it is plausible for, uh, you know, again, I know Sherm's group's working on it, our group's working on it, for getting this working for the histone modifications, but. Uh. Could I just add one thing? Uh, again, there are, cross-linking is the other issue, and I think uh, Gordon Hager has used, mm -hmm. uh, with isolated nuclei, used laser pulse cross-linking to get very instantaneous pictures. So Gary, how high throughput are some of these microscopy approaches? Can you also look at, you showed HP1, but H2AV and other histone variants that might be involved here? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can certainly do the microscopy. The, the, the problem is that you're still looking at every, um, uh, you're looking at the blob. <laughs> you're not looking at a particular sequence. It's sort of similar to the question that I asked Susan about, about the array. Um, you, 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 at least from my perspective, you want to understand what's happening at, at the level of resolution that we can get for chip seek, let's say, rather than, rather than, but and I'm not saying the cytology and the, the imaging isn't useful. I think it's very useful and tells you a lot, but we seem to have this gap and right between what you can see in the cell and what you can see um, biochemically. Um, so maybe, I think we should probably uh, just move on. Save it if we have time at the end, as people get tired. Dave, um, why don't you go ahead? Uh. All right, so my name is Dave McAlpine. I just want to talk to you guys briefly about defining occupancy. So occasionally, you know, I'll have a student come to me and they're like, all right, Dave, you know, this is my favorite gene, and obviously it's regulated by factor A. And I'm like, well, how do you know it's regulated by factor A? And they'll say, well, I looked in the mod encode browser, and there's a black box over, a, you know, fa factor A. And you're like, okay, so you got a black box, but what does that really mean? And then you can look at that in a little bit more depth, and you can see uh, the, uh, the two peaks here that I've drawn. We've got a big peak and a little peak. But what does the size of the peak really mean? So this brings up another question. All right, we've got a factor bound there, but we're talking about diploid genomes, right? So you've got two genes. Is it bound at both alleles or just one allele? And oftentimes, uh, work from the Snyder group, you can use SNPs to detect differences in these if you have a SNP right where your transcription factor is binding. But in the case that you don't, then you really still don't know whether you're occupied at one allele or the other. We also, uh, back to occupancy, these are all population-based studies where we do an enrichment. And again, what does it mean? Do we have one factor bound at a handful of genes, or is it more commonly or distributed and bound to many, uh, of the same, many copies of the same gene? And finally, a lot of the uh, talks today alluded on Hot spots. This was a, a big topic that came up in mod encode and encode as well. A very large fraction of the binding sites in the genome are occupied by multiple transcription factors, which often, whoops, wrong button, which gives you that view there. But when you expand this out, or is it the alternative that you have individual factors bound at many different loci? And these are the things that the chromatin immunoprecipitation, the CHIP seek approaches, have not quite. Uh, enabled us to resolve quite yet, and 
there are ideas out there on improving this, and I just wanted to bring that up to the panel and to the audience. Any I, thoughts? <laughs> I was just going to say, I'd also, I'd also add that um, it looks like uh, for all of these different um, events that happen, only a tiny fraction of them can even be associated with a simple uh, change in gene expression if you do something like knock down the transcription factor. So even if you set aside hotspots and other things, there are still a lot of mystery binding sites that seem to be true, seem to be reproducible, but yet don't directly lead to gene expression. We also have no idea what is going on with those as well. So uh, I'm, just, I'm just thinking out loud here. What, what about, uh, and it, this might be totally naive and, and, and stupid, but what about some kind of tagging of these different cells by, uh, say, mutagenesis? So suppose that we were bombarding a, a population of cells leading to different mutations in each of them, and then you could, you know, just like you can tell allele-specific activity by looking at, you know, SNPs between individuals, suppose that then you could, you could distinguish whether whatever chip uh, signal you're, you're getting is in fact coming from only one, many copies thereof, or different variants, if they have a high enough mutation rate. Would, what do you guys think? Is that plausible? I think you'd probably have to, you know, to get a high enough hit rate to accumulate enough SNPs in a population that are cell-specific that, you know, affected enough binding sites to be meaningful, that would be a pretty messed up cell, I imagine. But... It doesn't need to survive for that long. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. How but, do you interpret it at that point? <laughs> and I mean, you, you, you have the sequence uh, once you do the chip experiment, and then you can tell, well, was the, meaning, you know, was the binding site mutated and so on and so forth. I mean... Anyway, just, just one idea, starting up the conversation. Kind of a brain bow for, for Chip, yeah. It would be a cool, cool idea if one could pull it off. I mean, I think a standard, uh, you're raising good questions. I think a standard issue for multiple proteins binding at once versus individual proteins bound is to do sequential Chip, right, is a, is a way of getting at this. On the issue of quantifying these signals and what they really mean, I think that's a really important problem, and I haven't seen that perfectly addressed in any system. And certainly things we've considered but not, have not executed would be to compare occupancy with DNA footprints and such where you try in a quantitative fashion where you can see how much, hopefully project how much is really truly occupied in vivo versus accessible uh, and such. That's one way of doing it. I also think it's worth doing a, an experiment that we proposed and our grant but never got to, it seems, is uh, where you might actually, <laughs> should watch what I say, I guess. Um, <laughs> I'm fairly honest. Um, I, I think if we could somehow uh, set up, it's not a simple experiment, but to set up a truly open region where you put in something like lacropressor with known sites and then actually put this in and get it bound, you know, presumably overexpress it at a sufficient uh, amount and then actually see what that chip signal looks like with one site, two site, et cetera, where you really reconstruct the site in vivo. What makes it complicated is that you actually need to make sure it's open and it's not all occupied with histones and things like that. So presumably put bent DNA and things like that around it. Uh, but to truly recreate the, uh, a site that you can do quanti quantitative experiments on would be probably a, a useful thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I think we are getting close. I mean, with the uh, MNAs and DNAs footprinting, the uh, chip XO approaches, that you can start to see these specific footprints and binding sites, and can you start to resolve, you know, hot spots there? What's the, you know, seed factor that's binding? You know, we are getting there, but maybe some of the stuff that Jason Lieb is doing, looking at the, the dynamics and the turnover of specific, you know, factors with these com competitive experiments as well. So maybe one imperfect way to uh, approach what Manoli was suggesting is to make use of natural diversity. So for instance, in a population like the uh, B cells, look at the immunoglobulin genes, you've got a lot of variation there. You know that it differs by cell, and so maybe that's one way you could do it. Sorry, I think I, 
I'm not sure the microphone, did you hear? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, let me, well, let me try it again. So, so Manoli was suggesting that it would be nice to have cells that you knew were the same, had the same promoter, but where the alleles were different, and so you could mark what was going on, and therefore uh, try and disentangle what's happening at the single cell level versus the population level, and I'm suggesting you could use immunoglobulin gene promoters, uh, and because the, the variable region acts as a, as a marker. So it is your built-in variability. In other, in other senses, the promoters ought to be the same in inverted commas. But I think the issue there is that you can use that variability for that locus, not for the whole genome. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so regarding the levels, I mean, um, what about just systematically doing enhancer experiments for uh, regions that are bound at different levels and then trying to get a functional readout of what the implications of that are? In other words, I mean, we're observing these differences in intensity in the binding, but Perhaps with some of these large-scale validation techniques, we can now start applying them to test, you know, all of these different signatures, all of which we're calling peaks, and basically see if we should be thinking of big peaks and small peaks and wide peaks and narrow peaks. And Are you talking uh, about in vitro or like an in vivo titration experiment? Uh, I, I actually wasn't thinking about sort of a biochemical binding experiment. I was actually thinking of a reporter assay where you're asking, is that functioning as an enhancer? And then that reporter assay can be, you know, any of the above. But I, but, um, so basically besides just validating the biochemical activity of what's happening there, asking if whatever signal we're observing, in fact, has functional ramifications. Because I don't think we even understand that. I mean, if you see a, I mean, would you bet, I don't know, your cat that a big peak is going to respond more than a small peak? Right, but maybe you have a factor that binds, it's very good at turning on a specific enhancer or, or promoter, but it only binds a very small fraction of the time. So I don't know how you separate the biology from the, bi I mean, the downstream output from the input. So what you're saying is that in, in different loci, basically the, the I, 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 mean, I could misinterpret your question as to sort of, you know, in a different context, a little bit will matter more, and in another context, you'll need a lot of the same factor, and therefore, you would need to do this sort of functional experimentation with many different reporters to actually test the importance of the context. Is that what you were saying, or something else? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> How about Mike, and then so, we'll move so, on. So to, to meet this goal is, is really lofty right now, and I don't see that this is something that's achievable today, but it is important to know that parts of this are addressable. Like, like Mike's net, Mike Snyder said, if you want to know about any two factors at a time on the same piece of DNA, you can do sequential chip. It doesn't work well for all antibodies, it's not easy, but it, you can get at one part of this problem. Similarly, you bring up the issue of the tall versus short peak. and and Code Project has done a significant amount of work asking, are those changes significant? And it looks like they are quantitative. It doesn't tell you is the occupancy 10% or 50%, but it does tell you that a big peak, more occupancy. Is it distributed among different cells? Is it uniformly distributed in a population? It doesn't speak to that, but, but it gets at that a little bit. And finally, I'm aware of one publication, Gary Felsenfeld back in 95, did for histone modifications, attempt to come up with quantitative numbers by doing a titration method. Now again, this was ensemble measurement, populations of cells, but they could estimate in the population, the average histone modification at a site was 80%, 20%. Again, it doesn't speak to, is it 20% at 100% of the cells, or is it 100% and 20% of the cells? There are ways to kind of approach this today. I think the problem is that you, you want to understand how it impacts the biology in the end. So anyway, <laughs> I think move on to Brent.
Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about some of the, the transcriptome uh, features. Let's see, there's a light. Okay, so um, so the transcriptome projects in in all the organisms that have been done, so the fly, the worm, and the human, have all been really successful, and each has led to the discovery of of thousands of new genes. Um, and Bob did a really good job highlighting all of that. Um, but what I'd like to tell you is uh, go over some of the things that we've learned, which actually tell you about the things that we don't know. Um, so, for instance, this graph here, this is all data from fly, but the, the same principles are true in all the species. And so this is like a cumulative um, uh, count for how many genes we see expressed um, over this developmental time course of 30 samples. And what you can see is, uh, if, like you look at this line here, it's, it's going up, and it, it seems to plateau a bit here, but it's actually still going up as we add samples on. And this graph down here is actually indicating how many genes are expressed in each of the different uh, experimental types we have. So this is the developmental time course, and if we look at all the tissue culture cell lines, the tissues that we've done, and treatments samples, every single sample that we look at, we discover new genes, or we can see the expression of genes that we haven't seen in other samples. So, so far we haven't saturated things. So there's a lot of new genes out there yet to be discovered, even though I think all the fly project and the worm and human have all done a good job. Um, another thing in here is in the fly project and the other projects, the vast majority of the sequencing data for RNA has been done on poly A plus RNA. So there's all the poly A minus RNA left to discover. And so in the, the fly project we've done a little bit and the difference between these two uh, lines here is actually how much additional discovery we can make in the poly A minus. And we've only done it on 12 samples, so there's a lot left, I think, in that aspect of the transcriptome to discover. Um, so that's just looking at discovery. Then over here, this is looking at actually splicing, but the idea is to look at the dynamics of gene expression. And if we look at uh, tissues, we can see that basically there's a lot of splicing changes that that change dramatically between different tissues, but these changes are actually diminished when you look at whole animals. And this is because you have two tissues where the splicing is very different, but when you grind up a whole animal, it sort of looks like nothing's really happening, okay? So this is the same at the gene expression level. So as we get finer and finer in detail, going down to single cells, we'll get more and more information about the dynamic. So I think this is pinpointing that we need to really get into doing single cell expression analyses to figure this out. And the final one down here, which you probably can't see over the heads, is really getting at this issue of connectivity between transcripts. So this is this DSCAM gene in Drosophila, which makes 38,000 isoforms. But the point is, it, using the data that we have, it's impossible to tell whether exons on this end of the transcript are on the same exact molecule as exons on this end. And so what we really need is this super long, uh, single molecule sequencing technology. So if, for instance, Oxford Nanopore actually produces a, something and it does anywhere near what's advertised, things like that might really go a long way towards addressing these issues. So. Manolis is just faster. Going to ask, is there really any bottom to the number of transcripts, you know, with enhancer transcripts, and with sense and antisense short transcripts around promoters? But more specifically, is there anything you can say about these poly, non poly A RNAs that might be insightful? Are they long RNAs? So, so a lot of the, the poly A minus RNAs that we did discover um, were uh, previously unannotated snow RNAs. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them were micro RNA precursors that were, in some cases, you know, 10, 20 KB long, um, and then just a lot of like non non coding RNA type things that were we don't have any idea what they are. Right. I wonder whether you could unmask some groups of them by things like knocking out the uh, stem loop binding protein for histones, so that that go on to a poly A site. Right. Right. Yeah. So then there are the the poly A tail less like histone transcripts and things like that. Yeah. Thank you. So I think what we need here is the same thing as, uh, you know, I was describing with the other microphone, namely uh, disrupting each of these uh, sites and then asking what do they actually do? In other words, um, I mean, biology is messy and what makes it so wonderful is that it can cope with how, much, how messy it is. And, and that's something that, you know, um, 
it is part of the design principle in a way that it can cope with stuff happening. And as you start sequencing deeper and deeper and deeper, I mean, you'll find stuff that happens that might not actually happen for any good reason, might not actually have any good function, and so on and so forth. I think what we're still lacking is the ability to sort of knock out that weird random, or not random, but rare, um, you know, junction that happens only in one cell out of 10,000 and see what happens. And um, I, I think that sort of from the discovery to the validation, perhaps the next challenge ahead is to not discover, you know, things any further down the rabbit hole, but, but instead sort of take the ones we already have and make them or see how often they're actually made or sort of localize them extremely precisely or, you know, disrupt them and see if they have any kind of consequence and so on and so forth. So I'm wondering if you want to comment on technologies that can do that, whether that's even a feasible endeavor to sort of start, you know, chucking them off on the, on the functionality side of things. Yeah, well, I think that's that's an area where the model organisms, in particular, are great at. Um, you know, so you can actually go in and disrupt all these different elements. So, and in fly, you know, recently there's been this uh, the use of back recombinating that Hugo Bellon's lab has pioneered. That you can now basically change anything to anything else and put it in the precise place in the genome. So, it's actually feasible to go and do these things on a fairly large scale now um, in fly. I think it's more challenging with worms, but it's, it's doable as well. I, I wanted to take it in a little different direction. Uh, so uh, your, your Venn diagram there is interesting. When you take cell lines or something, you get some transcripts. What happens if you sequence the same thing, uh, make, grow, you know, take the second larval stage from fly and uh, assay that 10 times? Ten different um, samples. Yeah, well, that's good. We have not done that experiment. We um, haven't either. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what these things that are in tissue culture cell lines only are. I mean, I mean, we know what the list are, but no, we don't just, know why uh, they would be. I mean, uh, some of these are annotated genes, so they're like real genes. But yeah, I, maybe they're there. But to but grow how much of plastic. this is? I don't know. Uh, I don't know biological fluctuation. Yeah. Uh, or or methodological. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just wonder where, where, this, where these extra things are yeah. coming from, whether it's, 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 it's not really that they belong in cell lines. It's just that they, they happen to reach your threshold in, this, in, in that sample yeah, yeah, and not that's in another. that's absolutely true. But they were, you know, they're below any threshold where yeah. we would call them as a gene in, yeah. in the other samples. Yeah. But, but I think isn't the point even with your analysis of, I mean, the, the point is to ask what's the total capacity of the genome, and if you think in an evolutionary context, you think there must be genes <laughs> sitting there that we don't discover as transcripts because we haven't figured out what conditions would induce them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the more treatments you do, the more challenges you provide, then the higher the probability that you'll find things like that. But, yeah, but there, I mean, evolution certainly helps. If, if the if the thing doesn't function well enough or uh, uh, have enough of a role so that evolution exerts selection to maintain the sequence, uh, then presumably uh, we're not going to see that, we're not going to see a function for that in the lab. Well, actually a lot, I mean, one of the features of the new genes in, that we discovered in the project is that they're more poorly conserved than the annotated ones. Those are actually positively uh, selected. Uh, so the, you're 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 selecting. F I mean, they're still under selection. They're just you're being they're being selected for change, right? Yeah, uh, and so that's also an evolutionary signature, uh, uh, because it's it be well. You compare it to neutral sites and you show that it's higher. It's a KAKS ratio. I mean, uh, sex sex is very good for this. <laughs> Um, my question was, we know a lot about this transcriptome, but what is mod encodes vision on the proteome with additional layers of microRNA regulation, et cetera, the proteome becomes very con complex. So is like mass spectrometry or is there other things that you 
are thinking about for the proteome? Because um, that's, that's where the function lies. Well, be, <laughs> being an RNA person, I would say the RNA does a lot of the stuff in the cell. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, certainly the, the discoveries that have been made in the transcriptome have significantly expanded the proteome, for sure. Um, but, you know, within the modern code projects, you know, I'm not aware of any efforts to do any mass spec type stuff. I think, the, yeah, you did. The worm, Bob, Bob did it for the worm. Okay. It just yeah. wasn't done for the fly. Yeah. And there, there are, um, funding for modern code is finished, so there won't be any from modern code for proteome, but uh, there. Thanks. Partly the words were taken out of my mouth, but even given the known transcriptome, uh, there's a lot to be discovered about the proteome. You know, there's the discoveries of initiation with near canonical uh, start sites, yep. all the translations of five prime UTRs and higher cells, how these change with physiology, even w with a constant transcriptome. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, so for instance, I think the ribosome profiling technology would be um, really great to use on the model organisms to really look at this. There's, there's always the post-translatome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and last but probably um, most important, Valerie is um, going to discuss uh, what I think ultimately will be the, the most important question for the impact of modern code, which is <laughs> can people actually get to the data and use it? Yeah, so I was inspired to uh, bring up this topic because I get emails like this one, which I do have permission to put up here, um, which I hope you can read. It says, you know, I'm, working in, I'm working in the lab of Barbara Conrad on the control of apoptosis. We're interested in finding out what factors bind to the Agle one locus, and in particular, whether SA30 is, is one of these factors. And so I have a list of questions. Is Agle one a target of SA30? What factors bind to Agle one Which factors bind to the larger Agle one locus? How can I get a list of all binding sites for, say, 30? How can I judge their relevance? <laughs> I'd like to know the answer to that one, too. <laughs> do, do you also have genome-wide information on another factor? How about CES1? Any information on that? And, and I get these on a, you know, fairly regular basis, and um, I try to help out and point them to the cool sites that uh, Goss uh, brought up, um, but but this this is the kind of um, uh, questions that a lot of the people out there in the community have, and um, I can't actually do all their analyses for them, um, and so and so I think that um, there are still some really key issues out there, despite our best efforts. You know that there are still some problems with finding and accessing the right data for a lot of people, um, understanding. Uh, what kind of analyses have been performed? In particular, I think, you know, scientists like to know um, what, what it means when they mouse over some, a, a peak and they see a, a, a statistical value of some sort and they don't really understand what that statistical test means or what sort of test was even performed is uh, tricky and then they get suspicious and then they don't know what to do with the data. Um, and then interpreting the importance and reliability of individual data points and, for instance, you know, within the consortium, we talk a lot about hotspots and, uh, and understand that, you know, every single binding um, event might not have an immediate impact on the expression of that gene, but people out in the um, broader community aren't necessarily thinking about these questions uh, in this way. And then also, um, a lot of people would like to do sort of intermediate types of analyses, not not be capable of downloading huge data sets and doing really complex things, but sort of do sort of mix and match kind of mid-level types of analyses. And I think it's, we, we either enable them to look at individual loci or pull down large data sets, but how to do the sort of medium level analyses is still missing. So uh, anyway, that was, that was my point. Can I, I uh, re is, go ahead. <laughs> can I rephrase your question as we need Siri for uh, modern code? Uh, in other words. <laughs> I, no, actually, I think that's part of the problem. It's now like Siri for modern code. <laughs> so, um, in other words, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that um, you have some um, level of interaction that can be automated 
and some other uh, interaction which would require sort of somebody hiding under the table and pretending to, you know, be a machine, so artificial, artificial intelligence. So my question is um, uh, twofold. So A, uh, can we add some AI so that, you know, people can sort of interact with it in a fuzzy way and, and ask, you know, human questions and get reasonable answers and perhaps even translate these human questions into lines of code that we can then give back to them so that they can modify these lines of code to sort of ask more precise questions. So that would be one, one way of sort of using AI to automate human questions uh, into sort of um, code that, that people can then run and sort of, you know, show that and maybe show a set of examples where we can, you can take all of the emails that you've received and have Goss translate them into lines of code and, um, you know, sort of have, uh, sort of, you know, find your, the closest example and modify it kind of, kind of thing. The second one is, uh, and I don't know if you want to go first, then I can continue afterwards. I'll, I'll no, continue you're on a roll. You're doing good. <laughs> you're doing well. So <coughs> the second one is, um, uh, go ahead. I, 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 I can keep going. So I'll, I'll wait until the end. <laughs> so actually, maybe, I don't know if there are comments on that. I mean, yeah, essentially, it's we've reached the point where um, uh, essentially we need the price of bioinformaticists to go down. Uh, <laughs> or the money to pay for them to go up. And because I think that without this, I think uh, that's a very good idea, but I don't know anything about the field of artificial intelligence and whether or not that's actually doable. Um, it is doable. I think Goss, in fact, and collaborators have made really good advances, really great advances in terms of the new um, formats that bring us closer to that. But, you know, it, it's a huge problem out there in the so NIH in universe where unless you have bioinformaticists, you're basically in deep trouble because you, you can't interpret this stuff. I mean, instead of yeah. having Valerie answer these questions, I mean, sort of having an army of, um, you know, sort of <laughs> um, kind of like a call center sure, if, over yeah, in, yeah. you know, somewhere else. <laughs> uh, where so NHGRI should have, have a... Um, yeah, uh, just a call center. <laughs> in India, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, only at certain so times of day. I, I, would certainly support, I would certainly support the AI and the call center and the more money for bioinformaticists and, and some more money for fly biologists as well would be great. Um, so I just wanted to, um, I guess, uh, amplify the point that you were making and you were trying to solve, which is uh, we, we've gone into modern code multiple times. And um, because I know people in the field who are in modern code, I've then called them up and said, could you please explain to me this simple question, which is I've got a promoter, what binds to it, this sort of thing. And they've walked us through it or they've just gone ahead and done it for us. Uh, so. Um, in addition to amplifying that point, um, it would certainly be helpful if you just, there's two basic things that um, non-transcription people generally query, which is, I have a promoter, what binds to it? Or I have a transcription factor, what does it bind? And if there was a, just a simple shell way of walking into that question, you'd probably solve 70 to 80 percent of the queries into modern code just being able to do that. And I understand there's lots of caveats and so on, and you can find ways to put that in. But if you just pluck a random worm or fly biologist off the street and say, okay, take your favorite gene, here's modern code, I'm not gonna tell you anything, go answer a question that, that you've made up, I think that would be very helpful. Um, because it, it really is quite difficult and it's intimidating to try to get at it. Really simple questions like that. So um, I get a lot of these kinds of emails also, and, uh, but I seem to be getting less of them, and I was wondering if that's other people are having the same kind of uh, reaction, because I think people are getting better at, at digging data out of, of modern code, so that's kind of an open question, I guess. For the panel, maybe, maybe, what kind of answers have you been giving them? <laughs> I usually say you should <laughs> email Gary. Because that's that not question. the impression so, that I get. Uh, I, just, I think it's the opposite. Okay. I think as more, I think it's more people are now accessing it, and, and that's certainly having, true. There's yeah. more problems, and I okay. think also some people just give up. Well, well I, I think that a lot of the a lot of the ways of looking at this and a lot of these kind of questions, uh, you know, uh, 
really they're, if they're just interested in their particular gene, they, they really need to, to go to the browser. That's probably the best way to look at that. And the kind of things they're in Intermine for dealing with lists is just fantastic. You know, but the problem that we're facing now with modern code winding down is that all this is going to go static and it's going to go into uh, clouds and at least in some places that I know of, you know, getting the IT people to let you uh, actually access some of those sites is difficult. So the, um, I, would, I would really hope that as ENCODE goes forward, and this is directed, I guess, to NHGRI uh, until 2016 at least, that they really make a strong effort to, um, to absorb the modern code data and to keep it alive and to keep, you know, uh, improving the, 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 the tools for people to access the data and to analyze it. So uh, I think that, um, you know, modern code kind of started as producing data and building a very complicated data infrastructure at the same time. And, you know, it's like trying, you know, you don't normally build an airplane, you know, at 30,000 feet, which is kind of the way things happened. And now it's actually, I think, in, in pretty good shape. And, and people, in my opinion, are having an easier time getting the data out. And uh, so if we could just, you know, make sure that that kind of continues to improve a little bit, I think a lot of these kinds of difficulties will, will go away. Yeah, I am. Um just to say, I've also had plenty of people come up to me and, and talk about how they have been able to use the data. It's not like a, you know, uh, it, it doesn't happen a lot. So, so there are plenty of people who figure it out. And I think with increasing familiarity with the existing um, databases and, and better incorporation into WormBase and FlyBase, that people will figure out more and more how to use it and at least get some utility out of it, I think. For us, it was really opaque, and even looking at a browser was difficult. So um, if you want to hear what it's like to be a clueless, wet bench scientist trying to tackle this stuff, I'm happy to fill you in. And, and one aspect is having that sort of, you know, email is one way, but really being able to talk to someone. So I wonder, you know, if it were possible to have, say, a workshop at let's say the worm meeting or the fly meeting or various things like that, I think it would be packed because I bet there are a lot of people who would love to be able to do this and if you walk them through it and you could talk to whoever was explaining things, you could begin to disseminate that a little bit. And I mean, a course would be ideal, but that's probably not possible. But if you could even have sort of some of these simple questions addressed at workshops in, in meetings or something like that, um, I think that might be really useful. So Flybase does that, um, and I think the DCC was at the last Fly meeting uh, at the Modern Code workshop. It, it, it is a very effective way. And I think, as, as Brian pointed out, I think that a lot of this is migrating, all of this is migrating to Flybase, and, that, and people are going to end up using the browser to go through there. So I think at least on the Fly side, that'll happen. I assume Wormbase, because it, it's really excellent, will be following suit. So, Okay, we have time for two more, and Manolis will have to do it over dinner. Um, uh, so it's a nice one you like. First one. Mark. Oh, 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 sure. Um, just really quickly, I, th I think it was very valuable that the way Valerie put this uh, piece of data, this real question um, up in front of people. And I was wondering if there's any way people can think of, of kind of collecting a lot of these questions and um, you know, sort of tabulating them together to get some sense of what are the really common questions that people have in terms of the data resource and, and ways of thinking about prioritizing, you know, building of a tool or doing some mid-level analysis. I mean, people talk about this a lot, but it'd be nice to get some data, you know, in terms of what, what are the mid-level analyses that really, you know, the majority of people want. And I, I'm just putting it out there to think about. I think that's a great idea. I think part of the problem has been that some of it goes to the DCC, some of it goes to individual investigators, and, and there has yet to be a, a real way to conglomerate it. Yeah. Last I'd like question. to add uh, to issue understanding what analysis w w have been performed for collecting data, and uh, probably like question, uh, will it be as a solution uh, if um, uh, if you will have uh, centralized data storage uh, for methods, for tools, uh, when customer will be able to, to log in through web interface 
check all steps of analysis if required, change some parameters, and rerun tools. So are you um, suggesting that in the, in the web databases that there be a way to, to sort of reiteratively run uh, an analysis, a query over and over again? Yes, when uh, all tools will be uh, represented in the form of some boxes, when you can check all parameters, algorithms which were used, was used and uh, even rerun on your own data. We're gonna let Goss handle this one. Yeah. I wasn't going to ha handle that question. Oh. <laughs> no. But you did something towards the, you, you mentioned that you can save um, at least certain um, configurations of tracks. You can, you can save configurations of tracks and in ModMind you can save lists and queries and things like that. Uh, I just felt I had to say something since this is about data access and uh, Brian was encouraged me to point out that Actually, we have these things called template searches, and the idea of a template search is we try to guess what people want to do, and then write a little page, which is really easy to fill out, where you can paste your gene in or your gene list in, and actually, there's a template that answers several of those questions. And we've kind of somehow, in spite of standing up and giving lots of talks at fly meeting, worm meeting, tutorials, and at this, kind of people don't listen. And we haven't had we haven't had as that many questions come through help at Modern Code as we expected. And it's interesting that it's been picking up quite a lot in the last few months. And we do get some of questions like that. We also get ones like, I'm studying this gene and I'd like to design primers for PCRing it. Can you do it for me? It's just <laughs> fin fantastic. And um, so, so one, you know, one practical suggestion that we could have, if we'd had this conversation a year earlier, would be make sure you forward all your questions to the help because that then helps us to know what the common questions are and then try to make, maybe make the really simple questions easier to answer. Uh, right. Can I also answer the other question that was asked? Um, so right now there is um, an effort to put up an instance of Galaxy um, onto um, what will be the permanent housing on Amazon, on the Amazon cloud so that you can then write your own pipelines and be able to run them over and over again. Now in terms of um, the automatic population of whatever the parameters were for all of the tools that were done on the analysis of the existing data. Now that won't be pre-populated into the Galaxy instance, but certainly we try to collect as many of those parameters as possible and they're annotated in the protocols that are in the wiki. So it's accessible, but there's a lot of it. So. I just want to make a quick Milska's comment and it contains word. the words legacy of modern code in it. So. What's that? <laughs> All right, quick comment. It, it, you don't have to answer it, but I, I, just like we're thinking, maybe the data will become obsolete very soon because everybody has or will have very soon the capability of generating modern code scale data, which has been amazing for 2010 and 2011, 2012, but perhaps not for 13, 14, and 15. Perhaps one of the legacies of modern code should be to actually educate people to use this type of genomic data and I think the effort should be placed now, not just in generating additional data of the same type, but also in educating everyone who generates this type of data to integrate it with the existing resources and to use this type of resources in any kind of project. And I think sort of funding the kind of computational and sort of also educational efforts for using this type of genomic data sets could be part of what's unique to modern code rather than just the data generation aspect, which I think has been democratized. You don't have that. Great, thank right. you. So, uh, thanks to the entire panel, and especially what's left of the audience right. for <laughs> thank you all. being here and participating. Thank you. I'd, I'd and, like and we'll solve all these problems tomorrow. Tomorrow, exactly. So uh, I want to thank again the panel members as well as all the speakers in the session. We're going to start tomorrow morning, promptly at 8.30. And for anyone who's going to dinner, the PIs, um, please just meet at the front of the room. We want to talk about logistics very quickly. Thank you.